Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Workforce Culture and LGBT Staff and How We Can Create a More Inclusive Workplace. I'm Susan Ryan. I am the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project, and I'm delighted that you took time to join us today. So before we get started, I'm going to just do some real quick housekeeping announcements. Want to remind you that you are in listen-only mode. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link uh, within the next day or so. If you've got a question, and I'm sure you will have some questions uh, for our host today, but please put them in the chat section, the question section um, to the right side of your screen. As well, you'll see there are a couple handouts that you can download. It, one is the uh, PowerPoint presentation of uh, today's session. So before I introduce today's speaker, I just can't let the day go by without giving a real shout out and a debt of gratitude to all the healthcare heroes, to all of you that are really working tirelessly, courageously on the front lines to really ensure that elders are living their best life in spite of this incredible pandemic that is just rocking our world, literally. Thank you for putting yourselves at risk to really, as we say, run into the flames, to do what you can to really protect and to nurture and to, to sustain those elders in those communities. To all of you, we are so deeply appreciative. So thank you for what you're doing. And now to today's webinar. I am thrilled Mindy has, uh, Mindy Cheek, who's the first vice president of Greystone Communities has agreed to come back. Mindy co-leads the sales and marketing initiatives at Greystone and works with clients across the United States. Mindy is a seasoned senior living educator, an education ambassador for the National Resource Center of LGBT Aging, and a TEDx speaker. Mindy and her wife Paige live um, between Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and together they have two boys, Casey, who's 29 and lives in Austin, Texas with his wife, Kate. And it sounds like an adorable and playful Henry, who is six years old. And just before the call, we were talking about the joys of working remotely and working from home. And um, I can just picture it, Mindy, as you described Henry and his tree fort with his Nerf gun as you're on a call trying to be very professional and so forth. But then it kind of connects with the importance of family is strong in their home. They work hard, they play hard, and most importantly, they love hard. Mindy's first session focused on LGBT um, concerns and, and that of supporting elders and how we really create a more inclusive culture that will really support those elders in the community. Our intention was to have Mindy do consecutive sessions a week apart until COVID hit. And when COVID hit, uh, you know, all bets were off in terms of what we all were going to be doing. But I am so glad when Mindy decided to come back and do part two with us, and this time focus a bit more on workforce issues and what we can do to really ensure that our communities from recruitment all the way through are really doing our best to create diversity and inclusion. So Mindy, welcome back and thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Susan. I wanna make sure I've got um, my screen ready to go here and the PowerPoint up and going. Hello, everyone. And let's see. You may have to help me out here. <laughs> so Janet, maybe I you can apologize. help. I am having some technical difficulties. <laughs> yes, you should just be able to open the PowerPoint from the, at the bottom there. Oh, here we go. Not yes. opening. Okay. So sorry. Let me drag it over here. Okay. And that's what it was, okay. Everybody see that okay then? Okay. Well, welcome to Work for, Workforce Culture and LGBT staff. Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate uh, the introduction. Sorry for the rocky start there. Um, I uh, am so thrilled and thankful that um, to be back 
I uh, am uh, um, just thrilled to be in this industry and, um, and thrilled to be a part of um, the senior living industry, especially in, in these times. And I just echo what Susan was saying about, um, you know, everyone that's in this industry right now, especially, you know, working during this COVID crisis, um, you are all heroes and everything that we're doing right now just to, uh, for the protection and the safety of our residents and the seniors that we're working with um, is just uh, commendable. So I just um, am so thrilled that um, to be uh, to be a part of it. So um, thank everyone for for their service. So I just uh, I I'm uh, again just thankful to to be talking on this topic today. I think it's important um, to uh, to bring this to light. I do you want to? Um, Again, I don't need to introduce myself again, but I am Mindy Cheek. I do work for Greystone Communities. Greystone is out of Texas. Uh, we're a national um, organization consultant firm. We um, work with communities all across the United States um, in operations management, uh, marketing, planning and finance, development. Um, we do as much or as little as communities would like us to do. I do head up the um, healthcare um, sales and marketing portion of, of Greystone. So I work with uh, many different organizations in the assisted living, memory support, and skilled nursing side of our of our organization. I have been in the industry almost 20 years and I've seen a lot, um, but as many of you have never been through anything like what we're experiencing today, so this is definitely much different. So hopefully uh, we'll, uh, um, I'm praying that we all find a cure and, and we're on the, the downside of this. But let's dive into today's um, topic. So we are here to talk about how do we um, get ahead of the, the workforce uh, issues. So pre-COVID, uh, uh, we were all um, seeing just a, an influx of, of new builds in, our, in all of our markets. And we know that um, most of our markets were seeing a lot of uh, new construction going up with freestanding independent living, for-profit, independent living, assisted living, memory support, a lot of memory support. And what that does is, is it creates the need for um, more nurses in our markets and, and CNAs and, and more staffing. In a lot of the markets that we work with, obviously, you have a workforce shortage. And so just the recruitment efforts alone, you have to be very creative. And, and how do you retain and retract and attract um, the staff the, that you want uh, to come to your community. So just being very creative um, without, you know, having to spend and, and increase your budget dollars. So you're, um, um, you know, going upside down in your budgets and, and, and when you don't have to. And so we're going to talk today about, you know, how do you really retain or how do you attract a different um, uh, type of individual, a diverse population, and that would be the LGBT uh, population. So what's driving really um, that change? And we've all seen this, and, and I'll go back to the aging chart. It's really, you know, we know that the population is changing, and we know by the year 2050, we'll go from that nice little pyramid to a, to a pillar. And so what that means is that we have people that are over the age of 65 will actually double um, to 83.7 million. So that's from 43.1 million from 2012. And so we're going to have basically more people in the United States over the age of 65 than we are under the age of 65. So more people taking out of um, Social Security and Medicare than we have putting into it. So we have the need for more retirement and more senior living uh, communities. So more communities are being built. So we have to attract more workers. So as we look at how we, how we attract um, this diverse population, I wanna dive into how we do that. And that is the growing demands of the senior workforce. So let's look at the uh, percentage and number of adults who really identify as LGBT in the United States, just to give you an example of what that is. So we know that um, in this chart is actually um, numbers from about um, uh, 20, 2011, 2012. So we know that um, there are roughly around women, uh, 
a little over 4 million um, LGBT uh, women in the United States and, and over 4 million men in the United States. Um, so we know that um, this is a population that um, we want to be uh, attracting. And so how do we do that? Well, we need to look at um, recruiting, re uh, training, and, re and retaining. So what I want to do is I want to break each of these areas down for you so we can look at um, some areas that you want to be uh, mindful of and very sensitive to as you look at recruiting the LGBT population, how you train them, also how you train your other staff members and the residents in your community as well, and also how you keep um, the LGBT um, staff members in place so you're not looking at a lot of turnover. So let's look at the recruitment process. I mean, first of all, we wanna make sure that you look at equal opportunity. You probably already have this, and I know you do. You have an equal opportunity uh, statement um, in, your, um, in your paperwork or in all of your documents now. What you wanna do now is you want to add the gender identity and gender expression statements um, into that equal opportunity statement. So as we look at here, just simply putting, we are an equal opportunity and affirmative action employer and encourage applications from all qualified individuals without regard to race, color, religion, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, national origin, age, marital status, disability, or veteran status, or to other non-work related factors. Just simply putting in the gender identity, gender expression, the sexual orientation, and then the last line, the non-work, other non-work related factors, basically tells an individual that you are an equal opportunity employer as it relates to the LGBT, um, uh, uh, LGBT community. So you definitely want to put this into your equal opportunity um, statement. When we look Mindy, at- yes, Mindy. Yes. Can I interrupt you? I don't think your slides are advancing. Oh no. Okay. So we, I see the uh, the pillar on one side, the pyramid. Um, I see that one, but I don't see. And I'm sure you're talking about things that you have a slide for. Oh my goodness. This so let's not, see if we can. I don't understand what I'm doing here. Let me. I mean, I don't know what's going on. And Janet, I'm wondering no. if you've got Mindy's PowerPoint. Ah, there. Oh, there we go. LGBT recruitment sources. That's there it. I see. All right. Oh, All right. Sorry. This is not good. Okay, let me go back if I can. Let me just go back here. I Perfect. apologize, everyone. I think what happened is I had it on a docking station and I should not have done that. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, so we look at the growing demands of senior living. Here we talked about the percentage and the number of adults who identify as the LGBT in the United States. So this basically, when we were talking about this, is basically telling you that, you know, there are a, num a, a large number of people that identify as LGBT in the United States, when you look at recruitment, um, you want to be able to attract these individuals as it, you know, into your communities because there are such a large number of people that self-identify. And so as we look at a workforce shortage, it's important to, to recruit to and to be, um, and to be, um, uh, I guess to, to open yourself up and, and to be affirmative to those people that, you know, have such a large um, diverse population. Here we, you know, really I'm just breaking it down into three different categories and we're going to talk about recruiting, re, uh, training and retaining. This is where um, the slide where we talked about the, um, you know, putting that into your equal opportunity statement. So hopefully you can see this. Hopefully my slides are, um, are, are moving along with me now. So again, just a few few um, sentences down, uh, you can see where it says the 
uh, without regard to the gender identity, gender expression, the sexual orientation, and then the very last um, sentence where it says the other non-work related factors. So you definitely want to put those words into your equal opportunity statement. Here on this slide, this just gives you some different sources to look at when you go to looking through recruitment and different avenues as you look at recruiting um, the LGBT um, community, different recruitment sources that you can go to and post your employment um, onto these diff different individual sites. So it, it al allows you to get the word out to more places, to, um, to be able to recruit to more people and to spread the word. So I would encourage you to, to, um, to make sure that you get your postings out to as many of these sites as, as possible. Even if you didn't want to send them out to all of them, even if you just send it out to the human rights campaign, most people are going to be looking at the human rights campaign um, if they're part of the LGBT community. And so they would go there. So you, you would, you would um, better yourself and in, in, in at least putting your, your um, job posting on the human rights campaign if you wanted to get it out to that population. Oops. When we look about um, when we talk about training, we want to break that down really into some different areas here, and it's really a diversity and inclusion training. And we want to talk about not just training for your new hires or your onboarding training, but also to your current your current employees, and also if you're in a senior living community for your residents. Um, your staff members, also your vendor, your vendors or other people. We want to make sure that there's um, people are, are open. There's there's no opportunity for discrimination. So when we look at um, your diversity and inclusion training, we want to make sure that the training includes key terms such as um, what does LGBT stand for, and and just breaking that down, it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Really want to communicate, you know, with cultural humility, um, um, using um, the correct nouns, names, and pronouns, um, and really just preventing any kind of bias that we can. So breaking down, making sure that we're we're including um, diversity and inclusion training in all of our onboarding as well as our ongoing um, uh, quarterly trainings that we have with all of our employees. The sensitivity training, if you look at sensitivity training, again, just looking at that with your staff members, your residents, your, and your family members that are coming in, offering this training to pretty much, you know, anybody that would uh, come into your communities. You had, if you attended the last um, presentation that I did, we talked about how do you um, really make your community open and affirming to LGBT residents that are coming in. Uh, and to live in your community? How do, you, um, how do you welcome LGBT residents into your community? And you want to put all of that training in place. So hopefully you are setting up um, your training um, to, to allow for a more inclusive and diverse overall setting and the training would already be in place. If not, you can reach out to organizations such as the lgbtagingcenter.org has several um, different trainings that you can sign up for and have people come in and do. Also the Human Rights Campaign, which is the www.hrc.org has um, trainings as well um, that, they, that you can download and, and have people uh, come in and train. Um, also, just through SAGE, uh, which is S-A-G-E, um, they have the National um, Association for um, LGBT Aging, um, and the, the volunteers, which I'm a national, um, I'm a volunteer, uh, education volunteer for them. And they have different uh, volunteers for every state and they will come in and every volunteer will come in and do different trainings for you. So I would encourage you to reach out to, to SAGE and to that um, department so they can come in and do trainings as well. When we look at um, retaining your employees, we want to make sure that you have non-discrimination policies in place. 
And those non-discrimination policies would add the terms such as gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation to your non-discrimination policies. If you pulled up your non-discrimination policies now, just looking at those, just make sure that you, it's a simple add, probably just a simple edit to those documents and just making sure that you add those uh, terms in, into those documents. So it just covers all of your um, employees um, equally as a whole. Um, you wanna make sure that your um, colleagues are, are covered and that the policy includes using them by their correct names and pronouns. Um, you wanna make sure that um, your personal records um, contain chosen names and pronouns for employees and their families so that all communication is addressed appropriately. Um, you may ask, what do I mean by that? You may, um, let me explain. You may have um, an individual that is maybe transitioning um, male to female and they may, um, they may self-identify as a female. And so for them, they may um, choose to be um, um, a female. And so you would, on their records, they would be, um, they would identify as a female. So those, and maybe they have a different name that they would want to put on their personal records than um, what their um, legal name was. So you would wanna make sure that, um, that their name as their chosen name um, is listed um, to, um, uh, to honor their wishes. Um, you wanna develop a policy that allows employees to use restaurant restrooms based on their gender identity. You may have to um, offer a single stall restroom um, that does not um, specify a gender. Again, this is um, all in a non-discrimination type setting. So this is again, you know, um, allowing for um, employees to feel welcome um, in your community. Um, um, permitting employees to dress according to their gender identity. Maybe you have um, dress codes in your community. So again, this would be um, making sure that you are okay with employees um, um, dressing how they, again, if it was a, a person that identifies as a female, then you would allow them to dress as a female. Under the um, benefits and programs for um, any LGBT person, you would wanna look at expanding the family and medical leave policy uh, to include anyone uh, related by blood or affinity whose relationship with the employee is equivalent to a family relationship. Um, there are some people that um, are in the LGBT community that maybe do not have a relationship with their um, blood uh, uh, relative. Um, maybe their um, family for whatever reason is no longer um, a part of their life or they no longer have a relationship with them. And so they have um, another person that is not of uh, a blood uh, relative that they consider family. So you would wanna cons uh, consider the Family and Medical Leave Act to include people that um, this employee would uh, consider family. Um, the next uh, bullet here was to ensure that employee health insurance plans cover transgender care. Now, some, most, a lot of insurance companies, uh, insurance plans do not cover transgender care, but a lot more do today. So um, this is something that um, you can negotiate with your insurance carrier. So if, if this is something that was important to you, this is something that um, you, could, you could certainly look into as part of a benefits program. Looking into uh, procedures and forms, again, this is all a part of retaining uh, your employees to make them feel uh, welcome and, um, and, and continue to, to um, uh, be happy working there and, and um, uh, just continue your training. Um, under procedures and forms, you wanna make sure, again, this is all a part of, of the discrimination piece and the protection piece. You wanna make sure that you have policies in place to protect against discriminatory comments. And in my last um, presentation on 
the resident piece, we did talk about residents making discriminatory, discriminatory comments to one another and protecting those residents. Same thing here, you know, protecting your staff members from uh, residents making discriminatory comments to them or staff members against other staff members. And again, I mean, of course, this goes um, not just in the LGBT uh, world, um, but, you know, any staff member, right? So, you know, again, this is all in a protection to, uh, or all in an effort to protect your employees, just making sure that your procedures and your forms have that specific language that it protects this uh, particular diverse population. Uh, one point on here um, where it says the option for unmarried couples to identify their relationship on intake forms, um, that would be from a partner status or the relationship status, because a lot of your LGBT um, partnerships are not legally married. So now that um, um, marriage is legal, um, that is something that, um, you know, you may, you know, that would be up to you, but uh, there are a lot of companies that still would consider um, a partner in an LGBT world to, or an LGBT um, community, they would still consider a partnership um, for um, unmarried couples um, for on intake forms. So again, just on your procedures and forms, just making that note um, and have that option available. Here we have um, just a, a, a little checklist um, for LGBT. This is just a to for a proficient inclusive workplace, just a checklist that you can quickly glance at and, and look for just to see kind of how diverse are you in your setting. When we look at um, your policies and procedures, your dress codes, your non-discrimination policies, and you know, you know, are you compliant? You know, do you have it in process or no, you're not compliant at all. And so um, here you could just kind of go through and, and see kind of where your community stands and, and where you fit and, and if you're, you know, what kind of work you need to do. As far as outreach and programming, you know, we talked a little bit about this on the last presentation, just wanted to bring it up again, because, you know, Again, we talk about, you know, putting your job descriptions out on, you know, the human rights campaign website and promoting your jobs on other um, recruitment sites that, that are specific to the LGBT community. If you have your, um, any, on your LG, on your outreach and programming material, if you are um, specific or you're advertising in, in newspapers that you know are um, targeted to the LGBT community, um, you can um, post there. Or if you are having programming services um, in your community that are LGBT themed, you're going to attract the LGBT community there as well. Um, if you have images such as these on any of your collateral materials, you're going to show that you are an affirming type community. Um, some communities have um, diversity and inclusion symbols on their doors. Um, they've created stickers um, for their um, entryways or they've put these on their websites. Some communities have taken their logos and, and created uh, a logo out of the rainbows just to put in specific collateral materials um, or a place on their website just to show the LGBT community that they are a diverse community and that they are welcoming uh, to all and that they do want um, to um, make sure that everyone in the LGBT community knows that they are a welcome and affirming, affirming community. So these are just small things that you can do that um, show that you are you are open and, uh, to this population. So things that we can do immediately, again, you know, the first step is to be open to changing. And, and it is still, even though, you know, we've, um, you know, been battling, um, we've been battling this for a very long time, um, as far as, you know, just, just the human rights of the LGBT, 
um, population. And, you know, it's it just, just to have equal rights. It's been going on forever. And even though the uh, marriage equality and the legalization of marriage has, has happened a, a few years ago, it's still, um, it, there's still a lot of discrimination um, in the United States. And so we still have to be open to change. And there's still a lot of, a lot of um, uh, roadblocks that have to be overcome. So people still have to be open to change. We have to stop assuming that we don't know anybody that's LGBT or that we don't have anybody that works for us already that's in the LGBT community. And so we don't need to have these things in place. Um, we need to go ahead and, and make the effort and make the, the steps necessary to go ahead and make some of the changes needed in our, in our um, policies and procedures and in our equal um, opportunity statements. Um, increase awareness and empathy and educate through training and through our onboarding and through those, those type of things. So um, I think the first step, obviously you're, you're on this call today and, and that's great. Um, there's still a lot to do and, and I appreciate, um, I appreciate uh, you being on the call. Um, and I am certainly here and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So Susan, I will uh, turn it back over to you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, wow, great pointers. And I appreciate checklists and, and different things like that. You gave us a, all a lot to think about. So I have a question. It says, or maybe it's a comment. This assumes the staff men, member tells you they're LGBT. Here in North Carolina, one can be fired and are evicted from one's apartment if they profess to be LGBT. So any comment or, or thoughts around that? It, uh, can, you, can you read that one more time? I'm sorry. Well, it, it says, it assumes a staff member tells you they're LGBT. Okay. Um, here in North Carolina, one could be fired and or evicted from one's apartment if I, I'm assuming that they're sharing that they are LGBT. Okay. And there's in there, I guess it depends on the context of which they're sharing. So are they sharing that because they, you know, and that's the challenge. I mean, there are many states that still have um, the, you know, the right to fire you because you are a part of the LGBT community. And that's unfortunate. You know, we still have a long way to go, even though nationally, um, you know, marriage is legal. Um, and there's there's not much we can we can do about that right now, other than um, you know put policies and procedures in place in all of our communities that that help with that. I think as employers, if we you know have policies in our communities where you know we have non-discrimination policies in our own communities, you know we you know we're not going to fall in that category because even though the, the state says you can fire someone you know if your community has a non-discrimination policy then then you wouldn't do that right so that's the first step in changing the mindset of the state um, if, a, if a person comes out and tells you that you know they're part of the lgbt community um you know it's probably in an effort to um you know because they trust you one um, and, you know, and I, I guess maybe I'm not sure why they're, they're confiding in, maybe I don't understand fully the question, I guess. Um, but, you know, Mindy, just to kind of build on what you're saying, it sounds that the role that leaders play in creating um, an inclusive community, regardless of perhaps what some of the state um norms might be but that that it's really important and creating those non-discriminatory policies are really important mm -hmm. um i think here's a, a question though that i think kind of pushes it you know we assume that we're going to have leaders that are, are fully embracing an inclusive workforce culture um, but what happens um, if leadership doesn't seem to be on board and you're an employee and 
what might one do if you're the employee and you're kind of feeling discriminated against and those those policies aren't there? Anything yeah. that you would recommend? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I was I was in a panel just not not too long ago and that question actually was raised and and you know the the challenge there is is if the state is um, you know if you're if you live in a state where you're protected by the state then then obviously you have the state on your side if you're in a in a state where where you're not protected by the state then then that's a challenge um, you know the only way unfortunately change happens is for people to to stand up and and um, and, and protest the change, right? And, and I'm not saying to, to stand up and picket and, and, and do those things if, if that's not you and, and that's not everybody, obviously. Um, but you know, the only way we're gonna make a change is, is to stand up for that change. And the reason that I'm out here talking today and the reason that I'm a, a volunteer education ambassador for LGBT aging is because I believe that change has to happen to protect this population. And, and we have to, you know, the, the, one, the one big piece, and I truly believe that when someone is, is, is negative about something or when, when someone is, is discriminatory about something, it's because they don't have enough education around it. They don't know enough around it, about it. And so it's our job to educate. And if we can get the education there, then then help and help people understand more about our mission and and really who we are, and and that you know the LGBT community is not a bad community that we just need to educate, then maybe we can change one person's mind. And and I would say you know just just by you know offering to bring in education, offering to 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 provide some statistics or offering to um, to, to, to pull in a speaker, you know, it, it pull, pull me in as a speaker or, or research, you know, some speakers in your state and, and try to get, you know, some education uh, for, your, for your community. You know, there's a lot of faith-based communities that, that I work with um, that, um, that, you know, I've, I've talked to and, and it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, there's, there's a lot of communities that, that will, you know, after after I, I do an educational presentation, you know, they just have no idea. And, and you know, there's a lot of minds that, that can be changed. Wow, that, uh, that was well said. And I, you know, as you were talking, I wrote down, you know, we all have to consider ourselves to um, take on the mantle of advocacy and to really stand up for equality and in inclusion change must happen education is a big part of it sometimes we do things just because we lack the um, necessary education to be more enlightened so i i think that was important and we will make sure we have your contact information because i also heard you say you choose you pick you and you'll help do some education but here's a question it said if we could do one or two things right away what would be the top priorities from your perspective? Um, I, I would say really just, you know, it's, it's, it's really changing, getting, getting the non-discrimination policies into, in, into, your, um, into your statements. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing is, is you, you need to put the, the words into your non-discrimination policies. Um, your equal opportunity policies, and then you need to set up, you need to set up some educational trainings. Um, you know, you, you've got to let people know that, that you are, um, that you're, you're a welcoming community. And the only way to, to do that is, is by education. Um, so, you know, by changing the language, um, that's a big step. Um, and and then the education around it, and then and obviously the, the training. Um, that's what you have to do. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. I mean, and, and it's and it's not a it's not a little thing. It's it's a big thing. Um, they're not none of it is little. Um, it's it's all big because a lot of times you you don't have everybody on your side. You have a lot of people. I mean, I've heard people say to me, 
you know, you can't just come in here, you can't just push your agenda. And, and those were people that were friends of mine. And, and I said, well, you know, it's really not my agenda. It's, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's a community of, of great people that deserve the same respect that, that you do. And it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's an uneducated mind that, that believes that. And, and I truly, I truly believe that, um, that you have to, you have to educate people in order for minds to be changed. Um, so, you know, you have to change the language. And once the people start to see the language changed, um, when people start to see we don't discriminate based on sexual orientation or sexual uh, or gender identity, then people see it more and then it becomes part of the norm as, as you know, it, it becomes normal versus um, abnormal, if that makes sense. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And actually just to tap into that, I, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts uh, during this uh, shutdown or whatever. And, you know, to give and receive love is so important to our shared humanity, to our humanness. And um, I think, you know, it's not your agenda, my agenda, it is our agenda as humans to be able to give and receive love. Um, here's another one. As an employer who offers health insurance to employers, are there health providers that recognize LGBT partners, or what can we do to advocate for those benefits? Um, there are. Um, I think now that um, I think now that marriage is legal, um, there you know it's it's probably more so now. You know it's it's marriage is legal, so you've got. I mean, it's it's considered marriage, so it's it's. But there's still, I think there's still insurance companies out there that that consider domestic um, partnerships. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure how to how to go about that now that marriage is legal, um, but something we could certainly certainly look into. Um, but you know, I mean, I guess that would be up to each employer if they wanted to consider, because there are a lot of people, you know, that have been in partnerships for, you know, many, many years, you know, 30 years, because marriage wasn't legal for so long for so many people. And they just, you know, for whatever reason, aren't aren't going to, to go down and get married at this point. Um, and so, you know, they just, they just never do it. And so, you know, to offer benefits to them is, would be great. And there are companies that that do that, um, so that would just be. Um, I, I mean, I'm not. I, I I don't know how to go about doing that, but I'm I'm sure that's something we could we could certainly check in into, and I could point you in those directions. We could work together on that. That's great. Um, what training is available to help educate caregivers who may be from other countries or other cultures? and are unfamiliar with the LGBT community. I'm thinking more about uh, caregivers in assisted living or nursing home communities. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, I, that's interesting because we, I, I was, um, I did a training not too long ago on, with a bunch of, with, with some caregivers non-related to LGBT. And what's interesting about caregivers from, from other countries is as it relates to just um, doing activities, as an example, they don't even understand, they don't understand our activity department or act activities. They don't understand what bingo is. They don't understand what um, our TV shows were, you know, when, when our residents were younger. Um, so that's a really, that's a tough one because, you know, having them understand um, you know, what, what a resident did, you know, when, when they were younger, it's, it's almost, you know, that's a whole lifetime of education, right? And there's a language barrier there, um, you know, as well. So it, it's, you know, again, there is a great training on just um, the, the history of, of LGBT and um, uh, similar, this, this really the same training that I, I did for you, Susan, a few months ago here. Um, and, and, and I do that training all over, all over, um, um, in several different communities with, with staff caregivers. That's the, um, 
the community that's the national association for um, lgbt aging through sage um, so you can look that up um, online and see who your representative is in your state um, and i'm happy to share that with you um, through email or feel free to call um, and I can get that contact for you. But that's just a simple education. But there will be a language barrier there, as we all know, um, and that's tough. It, you know, that's that's just that's just is what it is. So um, that's kind of where we are. You know, with with the caregiver piece. So um, well, I think whatever um, topic it is, there's a there's a language barrier there and an education barrier. Um, but that's all fixed through education. Again, everything everything can be fixed if we can just educate people um and i just believe that i think it's all it, it has to be through education so barriers resistance um can you speak a little bit about some of the barriers the resistance to change and do you find it more among staff do you find it more from the elders um but What's harder from your perspective to deal with it from the staff to staff perspective or from elders to that worker? You know, it's interesting. The, the residents seem to be more, more open, I think. And, and I think a lot of it has to do, the, your, your elderly population seem to be more, you would think they would be more resistant to change but I think they're more open to, to people of, of all backgrounds because they've seen so much in their lifetime. And I think, again, if they can just understand it, then they can, then they can process it in their mind. Um, and I, I, think, I think where the, probably the biggest barrier is, is, is in, this, in staffing. And, you know, when we talk about putting programs together and making sure that we have um, language um, to where we're not discriminating and and we have different programs to where people feel special we have to be careful too because you know we don't want to point out the lgbt population more than we would any other diverse population because then it looks like we're showing favoritism right so you you have to be really careful um, because it is it is a very uh, we're in a very unique um, position uh, because people will will point that out you know one staff a staff member will be you know very easy to point out that you're showing favoritism over one staff member over another so you have to be careful um, but I think um, all in all people you know are are you know understanding when they know more um, so um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think from a barrier standpoint, again, I, I just go back to, you know, people do better when they know better. And, you know, the whole Maya Angelou um, saying, um, <laughs> I, just, just, I just believe that maybe I'm an optimist, but I just think that that people always do better when they when they're educated. And it's our job to do that. And when somebody is is raising a barrier or they're raising a question, then it's our job to listen it's our job to hear them and it's our job to help educate them and and you know it's 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 not our job necessarily to change their mind uh, but it is definitely our job to give them the knowledge to help them change their own mind well first of all i have to comment the wisdom of elders and as you talked about elders who have lived through so much and they're actually much more open than one might expect and i think that's kind of a beautiful testimony to uh, the wisdom of elders and how much we can learn from them and their experiences and their willingness as they age to be better able to embrace differences and to really create that that culture that really gives and receives love and um, seeks to be in those warm relationships. Um, two last questions that I see. One is around uh, support groups or anything an HR director would want to know um, to be better equipped to support LGBT, um, those employees that might be receiving some, um, some challenges to their work life. Um, 
you know, I, again, I, I think I go back to if, if you have the, if you have the proper um, statements in your, in your policy, your discrimination policies, and you, you know, you may not know that you have um, a staff member that's part of the LGBT community. Um, you know, there, there's a common myth out there that, that people think just by the way someone looks or sounds or the way someone dresses that that you know if someone is is a part of the lgbt community or not um that's not that's not the case um there's many people that are part of the lgbt community that um you may not ever know um, because they don't talk about it or they're afraid to talk about it or um, they just you know keep that part of their life private um, so you know you may not as an hr person you may not ever know that that they have those struggles but if you have the um, the if you have your discrimination policy worded, um, you have the proper words documented or, or, or um, phrased um, the correct way um, in your um, policies and procedures, and you have it mapped out to where they know um, they can come to you, then that's really all you can do to protect them. And that's the same with any employee. I think I think any employee, it's up to them to bring that to your attention. Um, you can't go out and, and seek that obviously. So you have to allow each employee to, to come to you and to present those challenges to you. All we can do is, is um, make it known that you know, we're here if, if those problems do arise. So I think, it's, I think they have to own it, um, but you have to, to make sure that, that, you've, that you have it you know, in your policies and procedures and in your um, employee manuals and, and all of the, the necessary you know, documents that you have. Great, and last question, any, with COVID, has there been any unique impact or challenge with regards to creating inclusion? There's been a unique challenge with COVID on every. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> You, I don't. I, I. I don't. I don't know that necessarily um, with COVID in regards to LGBT. I, I think probably the biggest challenge with COVID and in, in the LGBT community is probably with the LGBT aging population. Um, most of of a lot of the LGBT um, aging population um, may live alone. Um, may um, have not not have any family. Um, and so we see a lot of a lot of challenges with our elderly LGBT population um, because you know they um, typically don't have children. Um, you know, a lot of them aren't married uh, or, or partnered. A lot of them, um, you know, live alone, and so maybe they don't have the resources available to them that a lot of other people would. Um, so there is a challenge there, and so. Um, there's been, you know, a big push to, you know, by human rights campaign and other local uh, federal club campaigns and, and other local um, uh, organizations in each uh, city to really reach out um, to people that are in the LGBT aging population to see if they need help or, or food or, or other necessities um, uh, to get by if they, if they can't make it to, um, to the store, you know, to get their needed supplies. So that would be the biggest challenge, I think. But that's probably, you know, not any different than a, a lot of other, you know, uh, elderly people as well. Um, you know, it's just a challenge that we face right now. So. Well, we're living in unique times, that's for sure. But Mindy, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, and I just want to, you know, suggest to everybody that's on this call, you will have a link to this webinar and to Mindy's point about education and advocacy. I think this is your tool to be able to go forth and to be that the champion of one. Uh, to make the difference in your communities. And I think you've given us a lot of really great information and we will make sure that your uh, contact information is included in the link that goes out so that should anybody want to reach out to you, they're able to do that. So Mindy, thank you so much for coming back. I know your life is, is busy as everyone's is, but um, really grateful for your time.
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And to the rest of you, I want to remind you that tomorrow we start the Elevate Rise Above the Chaos series. This is the Greenhouse Project's response to COVID-19 and really thinking about how the Greenhouse core values are uniquely positioned to address and to mitigate the spread of this deadly virus. And to start it out, um, we talked a bit about leadership today in Mindy's presentation, but Carol Silver Elliott, the president and CEO of Jewish Home Family and the director of nursing there, Eric Reguera, the, direct, uh, the director of nursing there, they will talk about how COVID has impacted their community and courage amid chaos and what is the leader's role in calming a system. Please note that this one will start at two o'clock. Most of our webinars are at three, but this one will be at two. It will be a 30 minute session followed by a Q&A after that. And on the next slide, we are getting ready for Nurses Week. There will be a webinar on uh, May 6th at three o'clock again. And it's a big thank you webinar. We have Dr. Uh, Jonathan Evans, who was, uh, a, is a medical director. He was at the Kirkland, Washington uh, community when COVID first hit the West Coast. And he's gonna talk a little bit about his observations in context of the nursing heroes that were on the front lines, as well as Dr. Barbara Bowers, who is a PhD nurse as well. She's gonna tell us a little bit about research and tie it to Florence Nightingale, who her 200th birthday will be um, May 12th. And on the next slide, we have on May 7th, part two of the Elevate series. Uh, once again, we'll invite Jonathan Evans back along with Jim Wright. Jim Wright was the medical director in uh, Richmond, Virginia, where from the West Coast to the East Coast, both of these medical directors will give you their perspective and what they have learned on the front lines of COVID-19. Next slide. We want to raise a toast to nurses, May 11th at five o'clock Eastern. Steve McAlilly, on behalf of the Greenhouse Project team, will propose the toast and really excited, Perrin York, who happens to be the daughter of Jack York. She's a singer, songwriter. She com recently competed in season three of ABC's American Idol. She is going to sing a tribute to nurses. So you'll definitely want to join us live to hear that and to grab your nurses and raise a glass and, and honoring their her heroism. And let's see, one more, yeah. So we've got a website that is filled with lots of uh, webinars and virtual events. Really want you to check out that website where you can find out more information and register for those upcoming webinars. Thank you so much, everyone, for spending some time with us this, this afternoon. And Mindy, once again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your insights, and, and your passion to make a difference. So we are grateful for you and uh, grateful for all of you who joined us. Take care, everyone.